Hello all, this is Christine, and I'm going to be talking today about gas mixing. <coughs> gas exchange is the process by which oxygen is transported to cells and carbon dioxide is transported from cells. Ischemia is insufficient flow of oxygenated blood to tissues that may result in hypoxia and subsequent cell injury or death. Hypoxia is insufficient oxygen reaching cells, whereas anoxia is the total lack of oxygen in body tissues. And diffusion is reduced oxygenation of arterial blood. So you have ischemia, hypoxia, anoxia, and diffusion. And um, you should know those definitions. <coughs> Within the scope, you have optimal gas exchange, which can proceed to impaired gas exchange if you have an acute or chronic disease process <coughs> and the absence of gas exchange which occurs at death. We're going to learn today about ventilation, transport, and perfusion, how they are different, how they are similar, and in what ways they are dependent on one another. I'm going to try to see. I think I need to end my pointer here. <coughs> so they, uh, yeah. Nope. Oh, and it all came up at once. It was supposed to come up all nice and neat. So we have ventilation, which refers to inhalation of oxygen, the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide and exhalation of carbon dioxide in the lungs. So we, ventilation is inhalation of oxygen, the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, and then the exhalation of carbon dioxide in the lungs. So inhalation, exchange, and exhalation. And then we have perfusion, which is the movement of blood. <coughs> Oxygen-rich blood moves to the cells, and carbon dioxide saturated blood moves from the cells to the alveoli for elimination. I'm going to go back to my highlighter. So, oxygen rich blood moves to the cells, but carbon dioxide saturated blood moves from the cells for elimination. So, that's all part of ventilation, it's linked to ventilation. And transport is the availability of hemoglobin in the red blood cells to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide as blood moves through the body. So you take away one of these concepts and the other two can't happen. Without ventilation, there's no perfusion. Without perf perfusion, there's no ventilation. Without transport. There's no ventilation or perfusion. They're all interdependent. We're going to review the respiratory system next. <coughs> Let me get my... ducks in a row here. So I have some notes. Okay, here you have the nasal cavity goes past the nasal pharynx and the oropharynx to the laryngeal pharynx the epiglottis, the larynx the vocal cords um, and the epiglottis which is part of the larynx down past the trachea to the carina which is this part here where it divides this is your main stem bronchus this is on both sides. This is called the main stem bronchus. 
and then secondary, tertiary, and so forth, um, bronchus. And then once you get down to here, this is your bronchioles. Bronchial, <coughs> and this is your alveoli. Your alveoli is surrounded by capillaries. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Here is your diaphragm that aids in um, respiration and I guess that's all we're going to talk about and for this on this slide. So here air comes in through your nose. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you have a little piece of bone here in your nose. Um, the rest of your nose is really cartilage. All this is cartilage. You have little tiny hairs in your nose that work to hum um, humidify the air that comes in and capture any little dust particles, which is why like if you're at a campfire or something, you blow your nose, you get all that brown stuff. That's your nose hair is helping you out. And then you go, the flow of air comes down here, past the um, oral pharynx, which is the only part of your <coughs> pharynx that you can visualize without an autopsy. So when you look in the back of someone's throat, you're seeing their oral pharynx. And this uvula, which is the little part that hangs down. And then the oxygen continues past the apoglottis. Alright, when we swallow, our larynx moves forward and our apoglottis moves forward to cover the larynx. And, <coughs> let's see here. I'm trying to find the, okay, here's our vocal cords. I'm trying to find on the big picture the, um, okay. <coughs> so here's the epiglottis. We have true and false vocal cords. The I don't know if this detail is detailed enough to show you that. It, the true vocal cords make sound and the false vocal cords anchor or attach the true vocal cords. So the harder that you push air up past the vocal cords and into your larynx, the louder the sound's going to be, and, and air travels back up into your sinuses and resonates in your nasal cavity. That's why when you have a sinus infection, your voice sounds different because your sinuses are full of fluid. So your epiglottis covers your glottis. And... <coughs> Um, it has three purposes. Your larynx has three purposes. To make sound, to allow for a passage of air, and to um, protect your airway. And here is the epiglottis. So, moving down, your trachea. Your trachea is ribbed cartilage. And, um, or rings of cartilage. And when it's being held open, you have a patent airway. When it is not, it is not patent. And then the air travels down here to the carina. Now, if you reach... <coughs> The carina, when you're suctioning a patient, you're going to have the patient cough, even if they're unconscious. There's a 
reflex built in here at the carina to protect your airway. Then the um, again the air w moves to the main stem bronchus, secondary, tertiary, and so forth. Here's the right bronchus labeled and the left bronchus. And you can just, this is kind of like a dissected view of the lungs. All right, let's talk about some causes. Oh, let me back up a little bit. I wanted to tell you that I'm going to, I don't know why the slide's out of order. But I wanted to tell you, once we get to the bronchioles, which are down here, they, instead of being um, cartilage, they're replaced by smooth muscles. And the bronchioles are just tiny little airways. Each of those alveoli I showed you earlier is wrapped in that pulmonary capillary bed. And there's millions in each lung. So there's three million in each lung. And each alveoli is just a thin walled one layer of epithelial cells to allow for easy diffusion to take place for gas exchange. The right lung has three lobes, the left lung has two lobes. All right, so let's move back to causes of hypoxia. I'm going to get rid of my highlighter. <coughs> Or try to here. All right. So we have suffocation, or conf that can cause hypoxia, which is being confined in a small space, um, being at a high altitude, so there's not enough oxygen, having inappropriate O2 flow rate assigned to an oxygen device, or um, those are the main reasons for suffocation. Of course, I guess if someone's deliberately suffocating you. And then the intervention for that is to stop the cause of the suffocation and administer oxygen. A second cause of hypoxia is hypoventilation. Hypoventilation can be due to anything that <coughs> decreases your respiratory drive. So anything from sleep apnea to cerebral hypoxia a drug overdose, multiple sclerosis, brain tumor, increased intracranial pressure, and Guillain-Barre syndrome, any of those just um, can cause hypoventilation or decreased respiratory drive. <coughs> Interventions, IVIG or Octagam for Guillain-Barre, I don't, a bagel, I don't, or interferon, for MS, Narcan, if it's a narcotic for drug overdose, BiPAP for the sleep apnea, and then for the brain tumor, chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery would be your intervention. <coughs> a third cause of hypoxia is decreased blood flow past your alveoli. And that just usually that's because you have a decreased cardiac output. Your blood your body is not pumping enough blood through your heart. <coughs> and that can be due to an MI. You had a heart attack, a hemorrhage. So somewhere you're losing body um, blood from your body. And it's not just getting to your heart to be pumped. An arrhythmia that's causing your heart to not pump efficiently. Electrolyte imbalance. <coughs> Coronary thrombosis, which is blocking the flow of blood to your heart, a hardening of artery or of the arteries, which is also blocking the flow of blood to your heart, and shock, which kind of causes um, a cascade reaction in your body, and your capillaries and everything get very permeable and diffuse. The treatment of the cause is how you fix this decreased blood flow past the alveoli. So for MI, it would be defibrillation, arrhythmias. There are different medications depending on the cause of the arrhythmia. Thrombosis, an anticoagulant, which I spelled incorrectly, I'm sorry. 
arteriosclerosis, you have cholesterol medication, shock, you give fluids, O2, antibiotics, if it's sepsis, um, if it's hemorrhagic shock, you're going to fix the cause of the hemorrhage. <coughs> For very poor cardiac output, dopamine and isoprel injection is two medications that are commonly given. All right, so that's the first is hypoxia, second is hypoventilation, third is decreased blood flow past the alveoli, a fourth cause of hypoxia is impaired diffusion from thickening of the alveolized membrane, such as an interstitial cystitis. So your alveoli is usually, I think, 0.2 nanometers thick. Anything that increases that thickness is going to decrease the diffusion or the transport um, of oxygen back and forth. <coughs> Some things that can cause this interstitial cystitis are tuberculosis, RSV, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, chemotherapy, some antibiotics, and amiodarone <coughs> can cause it. Then we have interventions. Um, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right. Almoron, pentosan, polysulfate, and dimethyl sulfoxide. These are some medications used to treat interstitial cystitis. A fourth cause is ventilation perfusion mismatch from blood passing through unoxygenated alveoli. That can be because the alveoli is filled with something else. So it might be filled with pus um, or from an infection or water, either from infection or drowning or from cyst um, congestive heart failure. So if it's Edema, you give Lasix or a diuretic. Infection, you treat with antibiotics. If it was a drowning, you do CPR. And the last reason is you might have a right to left shunt causing oxygenated and unoxygenated blood to mix, such as in a VSD, an ASD, a PFO. Um, I'm sorry, this is a ventricle septal defect, an atrial septal defect, and a paratent foramen ovale. <coughs> Sorry, my dog's in the background. She can see my cat outside, and she's in the firm belief that she can one day catch my cat. Ooh, and my cat sees a bunny. <laughs> but she has absolutely no <laughs> chance of catching. Ooh, very exciting here. <coughs> Actually, the bunny is pretty big. I think that bunny could take my cat. And the fix for a right to left shunt is usually surgical correction of the problem. So we have <coughs> number one, suffocation, two, hypoventilation, three, a decreased blood flow past the alveoli, Alve four, impaired diffusion whoops, <laughs> from thickening of the alveolized membrane, such as an in interstitial cystitis, <coughs> five, ventilation perfusion mismatch, because there's blood passing unoxygenated alveoli because something else is in it. And six, right to left shunt causing oxygenated and unoxygenated blood to mix. And I'm going to bring up the next slide here. Here's a close up of the alveoli. They look like grapes <coughs> with a capillary bed. And this is your bronchial here. Let me switch back <coughs> to the highlighter. So if this is all filled with something like edema or pus, 
or mucus. Um, it's not going to allow the passage of, <laughs> sorry, my cat and my dog and my, this rabbit are distracting me. It's not going to allow the diffusion of oxygen, so that's the ventilation perfusion mismatch. <coughs> um, then, for any reason, if this is thickened, that's going to make it more difficult for oxygen to come back and forth through. And move to here. If anything's blocking the flow of blood to the heart, if these artery is clogged and or excuse me, veins clogged and it's getting difficult to get to the heart. <coughs> That's going to cause an issue. So you have the the right to left shunting would be if there was a hole here that allowed the oxygenated blood returning from the pulmonary um, from the lungs to mix with the unoxygenated blood. If it's going back and forth and mixing it's gonna affect obviously how much blood oxygen is available for the your body to use so normally your um, air <laughs> your blood flow comes through your right then atrium to your right ventricle the pulmonary arteries that go to the vein and then once it's oxygenated in your lungs here's your lungs <coughs> the pulmonary arteries go to your lungs. Um, it comes back and then gets shipped out via your order to your body. <coughs> we have the process of gas exchange. This is all inhalation and this is all exhalation. So you have atmosphere of 21% oxygen and you have the medulla uh, which is the part of your brain that gives you your respiratory drive, it controls your respiratory drive and it sends a signal to your thorax for your diagram, your diaphragm to um, contract. Your nose breathes, takes in oxygen sends it to the trachea, the bronchi, the alveoli, then your pulmonary capillaries with hemoglobin carry that oxygen and transport it to the cells. Your cells use it. <coughs> when they're done, they release carbon dioxide and that's transported back same same way to the alveoli, the bronchi, the trachea, the nose, and you um, breathe out in exhalation and get rid of that carbon dioxide. <coughs> Let's see if I can get rid of the pointer or the highlighter. And we can watch this video. All cells need oxygen. It is the essential fuel to cells to stay alive and to carry out their various activities. Bringing oxygen to the cells requires the uptake of <coughs> oxygen from the air in the lungs, its transportation in the blood, and its delivery to cells all over the body. The first step is the taking up of oxygen by blood flowing through fine capillaries in the walls of the lungs air sacs or alveoli. The oxygen molecules change from their state as a gas freely circulating in the air, dissolving into a solution in the plasma within the capillaries of the alveoli. Once in the solution of the blood, 98% of this dissolved oxygen is taken up by passing red cells, leaving just 2% remaining in the physical solution unattached. Red cells are particularly well suited to transporting oxygen because they contain a special oxygen binding protein known as hemoglobin. Each molecule of hemoglobin itself contains four molecules of heme, an iron-containing pigment, which binds oxygen loosely and reversibly. 
Hemoglobin that is fully saturated with oxygen is bright red and is called oxyhemoglobin. On the other hand, hemoglobin that is not saturated with oxygen is purplish blue in color and is called deoxyhemoglobin. It is heme which makes it possible for the red cells to pick up oxygen dissolved in the blood, transport it combined with hemoglobin, and release it back into the blood as oxygen in solution, ready for delivery to the various cells of the body. Hemoglobin gives up its oxygen as red cells travel through capillaries in tissues where there is a low content or partial pressure of oxygen. The partial pressure of oxygen represents the level of dissolved oxygen in plasma. As oxygen is released and again is carried in solution, the partial pressure of oxygen in the capillaries becomes greater than the partial pressure of oxygen in the surrounding tissues. This causes oxygen to move out of the capillaries into the tissues and to finally reach the cells. This graph, the oxygen dissociation curve of hemoglobin, shows why hemoglobin is particularly suited to its role in transporting oxygen. The oxygen dissociation curve demonstrates the relationship between the oxygen carried in combination with hemoglobin. The O2 saturation and the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. The sharp upstroke and the flat plateau illustrate how oxygen is released to the tissues over a wide range of conditions. Its shape means that although the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood returning from the lungs and being pumped out by the arteries may be reduced to only 50% of the normal value, say due to lung disease or high altitude, hemoglobin will still be 85% saturated with oxygen. <clears throat> All right, moving on. This slide just shows you the um, medulla where the inspiratory drive in your brain takes place or your respiratory drive in your brain takes place. And then it sends that signal to your internal intercostal muscles and your accessory respiratory muscles and also your external intercostal muscles and your diaphragm. So you can see anything that interferes with that would cause a decreased respiratory drive. <coughs> or All right, so your consequences of impaired gas exchange. If impairment of gas exchange occurs when the diffusion of oxygen, carbon and dioxide and oxygen becomes impaired because of ineffective ventilation, reduced capacity for gas transport, or inadequate perfusion. <coughs> so we kind of talked about some of the reasons for ineffective ventilation. Reduced capacity for gas transport from reduced hemoglobin or red blood cells. We also talked about, but some other issues would be, for example, if you had a patient with sickle cell anemia, that their um, red blood cells were collapsing, and that decreases their capacity for <coughs> carrying oxygen. Or you have a patient with thalassemia. Um... Trying to think what else. Of course, if you had a patient with iron deficiency anemia, that would affect hemoglobin and reduce the capacity for gas transportation. I'm sure there are a lot of other things I'm not thinking about. And inadequate perfusion, anything that affects um, perfusion is going to cause inadequate perfusion. I'm trying to think. So... Like what we were talking about with the um, decreased cardiac output, any of that. <coughs> so this slide is kind of a, a review of what I already talked about. Of course, if you have impairment in gas exchange, you're going to get that hypoxia, which is the reduction in oxygen in your blood. Or you may even get... Um, anoxia, the total absence of oxygen in your blood, and then that's going to cause oxygen-deprived tissues and ultimately cell death. 
And of course, it doesn't matter which organ this takes place in. If no matter what the organ, none of them like being deprived of oxygen. So if it's your heart, you're going to have an MI. If it's um, your kidneys not getting enough blood perfusion and causing cell death, you're going to have renal failure. <coughs> What are some risk factors for impaired gas exchange? So in infants and children, we've talked before about how they have a airway that is smaller and more elastic. It's more prone to collapse. Their tongue is larger in, than in proportion to adults. Um, infants under the age of four well, months two to four months are obligate nose breathers so they can't breathe um, out of their mouth at all if they have a stuffy nose that becomes a big issue for them <coughs> um, they have weaker um, abdominal muscles and etc and then older adults older adults are more at risk because they've lived a life where they've damaged their heart or their lungs um, either from sheer age as you get older physiologically these things stop working quite as well as they did when you're younger um, and then of course if they smoked or drank or um, <coughs> did anything else or worked in a factory or uh, used asbestos as a construction worker Anything that would affect their lungs or their heart is going to put them at greater risk for developing an altered gas exchange. Age, we talked about smoking, obviously. Um, you have all the carcinogens in tobacco, and then just the particles in tobacco also cause your lungs to get build up with tar and really um, negatively affects your airway and then chronic obstructive pulmonary disease which is usually caused by smoking is affects the flow of oxygen oxygen through the body cystic fibrosis which is kind of like COPD for, for kids same thing and heart failure, of course, it's affecting the cardiac output. Immunosuppression makes you more prone to disease. A reduced state of cognition or brain injury is going to cause issues with your respiratory drive. Prolonged immobility just makes it so, um, for example, it'll, it's harder for you to have your lungs expand when you're immobile. Um, that's why I always have my patients sit up as much as possible when they're in a hospital and use the incentive spirometer so they can have the lung expansion. And then, of course, it puts you at risk for things like bed sores and DVTs. How do you recognize when an individual has compromised a gas exchange? <coughs> Start with their history and then move to their examination. So you take a look at their past medical history. How often are they coming in for anything respiratory related? Or have they come in to the doctor for bronchitis, you know, six times in as many months? Do they have a family history of multiple sclerosis, lupus, um, COPD, um, asbestos exposure? What are their current medications? Anything that could lend itself to developing, for example, interstitial cystitis, like amiodarone. Lifestyle behaviors, do they smoke? What's their occupation? If they work at a factory, they have a higher risk than if they patients have stayed home mother their whole life. Their social environment, do they live in crowded housing? And what's their problem-based history? And then taking a look at their vital signs, including their oxygen saturation, breathing, their breathing effort, their work of breathing, their color, um, their appearance, <coughs> their thorax, 
Um, a, a lot of the times in patients with COPD, they get like a barrel chested appearance. Their chest becomes really pronounced. Look at their extremities. Do they have good cap refill? Are there any signs of acrocyanosis? And then listen to their lung sounds very carefully. All lobes, start at the apex, move your down, way down to the base, alternate sides. This is a patient with acrocyanosis. This is modeling. <coughs> Unless the patient has Reynolds disease, this is always not a, a bad thing. This is a pretty significant example of acrocyanosis. This is a less obvious. There's some clubbing here too, it looks like. Clubbing here is usually caused by polycythemia. The body comp tries to compensate from its lack of oxygen by increasing the production of red blood cells. And it makes your um, blood very viscous when it does that. And this causes this part of the reason of this clubbing of your fingers. It ends up that the angle of the nail bag gets distorted. And this is gets wider here. So you do arterial blood gases, a CBC, a sputum, testing for TB usually, a biopsy if necessary. Start with a chest x-ray and work your way past to these um, CT scan, MRI, and these other radiograph radiologic studies, pulmonary function test or endoscopy. This is a patient getting um, an arterial blood gas done. You need to have ice waiting unless you have the capacity to run the test right at the bedside. This sample is going to need to be put on ice. The physician does this or the respiratory therapist. It's more painful than a venous straw because it's a little deeper. And you have to apply pressure for at least 5 minutes, 5 to 10 minutes and longer if it's a patient on a blood thinner. Because this is an artery, if you don't put enough pressure on it, it, the blood can start spurting on the walls. This is a sample arterial blood gas analysis. And um, you just need to know, for now, a normal pH. <laughs> My dumb dog looking at a rabbit. Um, bicarb is 24 plus or minus 2. PCO2 is 35 to 45. PO2 normal is 80 to 100. Those are the values that you should know for now. You're going to go into this in depth with Mrs. Kiefer. Before you graduate nursing school, you really need to know what normal, at least normal hemoglobin and hematocrit are. For a male, it's 14 to 18. A female is 12 to 6. For the hemoglobin and hematocrit, it's 42 to 52 or 37 to 47 for a female. Females are always a little less because women of childbearing age have a period once a month and it, they lose a little red, um, blood. And then you have white blood cells. You need to know this um, before you graduate from nursing school also. What a normal white blood cell count is. 50,000 to 10,000 is normal for adult or child more than two years. Child less than two years can be a little higher, up to 17. A newborn can be up to 30. In reality, though, if it was really 30, um they'd get a workup. <coughs> and then a platelet count, 150 to 400,000 is normal. So now that you can identify if your patient is having respiratory difficulties, what do you do about it? Encourage good infection control, excellent hand hygiene, Smoking cessation, immunizations, 
and prevent post-operative complications by encouraging the incentive spirometer, making sure they're wearing their sequential compression device or SCDs, making sure they're wearing their TED hose, making sure they're getting anticoagulant therapy if they've just had surgery. <coughs> We're going to talk a little bit more about each of these. This is an example of postural drainage used to um, help increase um, oxygen diffusion in your lungs. So if you have a patient, <coughs> for example, with cystic fibrosis, that it has clogged lungs from all that sticky mucus, um, they'll do this postural drainage or a patient with pneumonia, and this is where the respiratory therapist will be performing chest PT. This patient here is tripoding. If you have a patient in severe distress, you help them sit up upright. That really helps them. I, I can't tell you how many times I've come in and seen a patient in severe respiratory distress, and the nurse has them laying flat. <coughs> sit them up. It helps a lot. Just for you to know that um, if you doing chest PT, if you have them hold each position for five minutes to help the mucus strain from your, their lungs, and then when you're if you have to give chest PT, you should know that you need to clap your hands um, quickly and rhythmically, and you need to cup your hands at your knuckles to form um, of the cup correctly. If you're doing it right, you're going to hear a hollow sound. If you hear a slapping sound, your hand is not cupped enough. And you should never do it right after a meal because this is going to increase the chance of vomiting. Here's the patient, a uh, baby getting postural drainage. And if you do it on a chest PT for a baby, you just use two fingers. All right, a review of oxygen therapy devices. You have the nasal cannula for a pediatric patient. It's half liter to four liters per minute. It can go up to six liters um, if it's humidified. An infant can be a quarter liter to two liters. Simple face mask for a pediatric patient is six to ten um, liters per minute. An infant is five to eight. Partial rebreather is 10 to 12 liters per minute. A non rebreather is 10 to 15, and the aerosol is 8 to 12. Mama, are you trying to something? No. I was supposed to have it. Oh, okay, I'm recording something. I thought you were talking to me. Okay, um, oxygen tents and hoods are used for pediatric patients who have airway inflammation, croup, or other respiratory infections. And the hood develop, delivers anywhere from 28 to 85%. You need to set the rate from 5 to 12 liters per minute. And there's a little oxygen detector that you put right next to the patient's face because the um, concentrations in the hood can vary dramatically. So you need to put it right next to the patient's face so you can get a good feel of how much oxygen they're actually getting. Here's an example. It looks like a little astronaut helmet. It needs to be um, really more than 7 liters to wash out carbon dioxide. Yeah, this one says five. Let's go with the seven. Um, I guess if you ask five textbooks, you're going to get 20 answers. You might need to put nasal cannula on the patient as well when they're in the hood for feedings and nursing care. Keep in mind this... Um, is nice humidified environment so you have to monitor the patient for any skin issues <coughs> here's a patient in a 
tent. Oxy, uh, then we have the simple face mask, 6 to 10 liters per minute. It can provide concentrations of 40 to 60. Remember, never ever less than 6 liters or you are giving your patient carbon dioxide. And um, this, this is an adult. This is why it says 1 to 6 liters. You can go back to this, which I got from the um, National Respiratory Therapy Association's website <coughs> for pediatrics. But for adults, nasal cannula is 1 to 6 liters, and you should humidify if it's over 4. This is a blender. It allows you to give um, the same flow rate, so you can give four liters, but change the percent oxygen. It's used more in the NICU to prevent retinopathy of prematurity. Same, same idea as a Venturi mask. <coughs> then we have the non-rebreather. has to be 10 to 15 liters per minute. If you take one of the valves off, it becomes a partial non-rebreather. Monitoring O2 levels, your patient should be on a pulse ox, obviously, if they're on oxygen. And um, if they're a pediatric patient, the pulse ox site has to be changed every shift. If they're a newborn or infant, they have to have it changed every four hours. In the NICU, they change it every two hours because it can cause a burn from the light. Well, if you have to suction a patient... Remember, the suction catheter sizes starts from 5 French and works up to 14 French in an adolescent. You should always use a catheter size that's approximately... <laughs> my stupid dog. I'm really sorry, guys. Half the <laughs> inner diameter of the tracheostomy tube. Stop it! <laughs> ah! I was going to say they fight like cats and dogs, but I guess that's stupid. <laughs> yeah, of course they do because they are cats and dogs. All right. It's important to pre-oxygenate children. Every time that you suction a patient, remember a uh, child, you have to pre-oxygenate them. You should have them on a pulse ox. If they fall below 90%, you need to stop. In infants and younger children, 1.6 to 3 inches is the length of the catheter that you can use for suctioning. No, don't insert it more than that. In older children, it's three to five inches. The rule of thumb is to measure from the tip of the patient's nose or their mouth to the angle of their mandible. So pre-oxygenate, number one. Number two, have them on a pulse ox. Number three, stop if it gets to 90%. Number four, if it's three to five inches for an older child. Five, for a younger child, it's 1.6 to three inches. And six, a rule of thumb is tip of the nose, the angle of the mandible. Those are your six rules for suctioning. And then, again, the suction pressure. If you can't use an adult suction pressure on a neonate or an infant, you can give them a pneumothorax. So it's 60 to 80 for a neonate, 80 to 100 for a child, and 80 to 120 for an adolescent. If you are applying nasal tracheal suction, We just talked about this. This is, I'm contradicting myself here. Hold on. Yeah, because this says three to five inches for older children. And then this is six to eight. <laughs> All right, great. All right, well. I'm, we're going to disregard this. Blah, blah.
blah, blah, blah. We'll go with the more conservative estimate. The predicted size for uncuffed um, tubing for if you're going to intubate someone, you take the age divided by 4 plus 4. So if you have a 4-year-old, it's 4 divided by 4 plus 4. So you would have an ET tube size of 5. And you're not going to use a cuff tube, ET tube, um, under the age of 8 except in extreme circumstances. For a cuff tube over the age of 8, it's the age divided by 4 plus 3. So uncuffed, it's plus 4. And cuffed, it's plus 3. And that is the end of the slideshow. I'm sorry about my dog. <laughs> She's so stupid. Um, and if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you. Bye.